Okay, I've got the, all the hydraulic components here now. <laughs> we looked at the case and the and the the major housing components. We looked at all the major guts, the the gears, um, and the shafts, uh, and the torus. And now here's the controllers. This is the what they refer to as an analog uh, computer in lo a lot of the documentation here. Um, for the control of all of those uh, components that we've looked at. So, uh, to begin with, there are two oil pumps that uh, generate up to around 80 PSI is all on this transmission. So, we have a rear oil pump assembly right here. This rear oil pump assembly um, is driven with this gear right here off of the output shaft. So I, so I showed you that uh, gear on the output shaft and I told you that we could push start a vehicle with this transmission. Um, this shaft as it rotates uh, spins a uh, gear and crescent uh, pump here on the end. As you can see, a gear and crescent pump. There's the crescent right there. Here's our gears. Um, this pump spins in relation to uh, vehicle speed, proportional to vehicle speed. Um, now this is the bottom of the pump. So the pump sits in the in the vehicle like this. This is the pickup tube for the pump and this is the oil screen for this transmission. I want you to notice it has an inlet right here for the front oil pump and an inlet right here for the rear oil pump. This is a screen, not a filter. Um, it's called the oil screen. All right, this shaft, besides spinning the pump, spins a piece over here on the end called the governor. And we've talked a little bit about the governor up to this point, but the governor, in relation to controlling an automatic transmission, uh, is a fantastic invention and discovery. Now, governors have been around for a long time before the automatic transmission, but nobody had really put it together for controlling hydraulic pressures uh, that increased with vehicle speed um, to cause shift valves to move, to cause upshifts to take place uh, until this group of uh, the developers of the hydro hydromatic transmission. Uh, the governor has three uh, fluid passages. It has a, a governor feed off the off of one of the oil pumps, and then it puts out two different pressures: governor one and governor two. There's a big heavy weight right here that flops back and forth, and as this rotates, those weights flip out. It has a light little weight on the other side here. Um, the heavy weight will come out first and give us uh, a governor pressure, well, it'll start to come out. It doesn't just all of a sudden come out. It gradually uh, moves out uh, a variable governor pressure. And then uh, this smaller weight will come out even farther slowly and give us a variable governor pressure. So we've got a, a governor pressure for uh, probably two shifts. I, I haven't verified that. Uh, maybe the one, two, and the three, four. Uh, I need to look at the hydraulic diagram again to see for sure. But the whole purpose of a governor from the original hydromatic transmission all the way up through elect the, the advent of electronic transmissions, electronic control transmissions, where most of them got rid of the governor, uh, was to create a fluid pressure that would increase with vehicle speed. The governor has two functions, to force upshifts and to delay downshifts. So that's what the, the governor does. So let's get the rear oil pump out of the way here. Now we have the front oil pump here. It has its own uh, pickup tube that goes into the front of that oil screen uh, that we looked at. Um, the original 1940 through 1950 oil pumps were a gear and crescent style oil pump 
just like that rear oil pump is that I just showed you. But this one, this one totally blew me away when I uh, took it apart. This is a variable capacity or variable volume uh, oil pump. And way back when I first started going through transmission training as a technician, I learned about variable volume oil pumps in the in the GM uh, 700 uh, R4. Um, it was supposed to help improve fuel economy by reducing the drag on the engine from having to move a high volume of oil at an idle when you really didn't need to. Dropped one of the lock washers here. There we go. Okay. So, <laughs> I open up this oil pump. Come on. It's got two guide pins or alignment pins that hold it in place. Just fell off the other day. going to lightly help it out a little bit. I don't want to scratch that surface. There's no gasket there, so I don't want to... damage the ceiling surface. There we go. Alright, so... <laughs> take a look at this. This is a variable volume oil pump. And it has a spring-loaded slider, just like what I thought was modern technology back in the 80s. <laughs> Turns out it's been around since 1951 when they first used this, this model here. And the way the variable volume works is this slider moves back and forth. There's a rotor and a seven-vane uh, pump here. It's a vane style pump that is turned by the uh, the uh, Taurus cover which is connected to the engine. So this spins at engine speed. Um, it turns at engine speed and this will change the volume output of the pump by increasing or decreasing the distance between the outside of the uh, inside hub and the outside of the bore of that slider ring. All right, so uh, that's totally um, <laughs> shocking to me. Uh, I guess that proves how ignorant I am of old technology, which is why this is so exciting to me to get into this transmission. Um, the uh, two alignment uh, dowels line up right here. We've got a fluid passage to come in and increase fluid volume. We have a fluid passage to come in on the other side and decrease fluid volume. All of that is controlled by a pressure regulator valve on the side of the transmission. This screws in through the side, kind of the top side of the transmission, comes in here, and if we push it all the way in, we get high volume, high pressure. If we uh, let it come out a little bit, then we get lower volume, lower pressure. So it's a variable pressure. This has a couple of boost valves in it. So when we go to reverse, we can boost the pressure in reverse. And I believe there's a low boost also in looking at the hydraulic uh, diagrams here. There's a suction side where it pulls fluid out of the, the filter screen. And there's a pressure side where it sends fluid out to the valve body that we're going to look at here next. Now there's a valve on the back here called the bypass valve, and this prevents uh, overpressurization of the system. If the pressure gets more than, from what I read, 80 psi, I, I could be wrong, uh, this valve opens and it just bleeds the excessive fluid into the, or fluid pressure into the uh, rest of the transmission bottom pan. All right, so that is our front oil pump. Um, the uh, another thing you don't see a lot of are the the screws themselves are just flathead uh, screws rather than bolts that hold all of this 
together. I see a lot of that in, in this transmission. Um, I'm glad we went to bolts uh, later on because the screws can be difficult to um, remove, especially if somebody has stripped them out the slot uh, previously. All right, so we've got a rear pump, we've got a front pump. The rear pump has a check valve where it feeds the front pump so um, it won't just blow its uh, pressure off uh, into an empty passage when it's running off of the rear pump only during a push uh, start. Okay, so let me get the front pump uh, out of the way along with its bolts. All right, now the front pump and the rear pump feed fluid to basically the brain of the, of the transmission, the, the valve body right here. So this valve body um, contains valves that control pressure uh, to the clutch packs and the bands. It has timing valves that control when do we apply the uh, clutch packs or the bands. It also has another valve uh, that's called the throttle valve. Now there, on these old transmissions, everything was mechanically linked uh, to, the, to the transmission. So, for example, this, this piece of linkage right here that would bolt on to the, the valve body here to this outer outer housing right here uh, is your shift mechanism. So when you moved your your gear shifter uh, on the column back then, it would move the gear selector right here that moves what we today refer to as a manual valve back and forth that routes fluid to the appropriate clutches for moving forward in drive or no fluid in neutral, uh, the proper fluids for reverse. Uh, since this is a dual range uh, transmission, this had the equivalent of drive four and drive three, where the previous transmissions only had uh, drive and low and reverse and neutral. So this model allowed you to manually shift down to third gear and force it to stay in third gear until you reached a vehicle speed of which it would shift to fourth anyway uh, versus th your throttle angle and then it would shift to fourth. Uh, remember, fourth gear is direct drive on this transmission from the engine all the way to the output shaft of the transmission. So uh, downshifting to third could give you a little more zip for going up hills um, if you were heavily loaded. Now, the this outer piece right here is the throttle valve linkage. And this big long piece of, of linkage here went all the way up to the carburetor on this end and all the way down to another piece of linkage right here on this end. And what that did was it would rotate versus throttle angle, it would rotate and push on a spring-loaded valve in here called the throttle valve. And what the throttle valve does is it makes a pressure that at low throttle or at a idle, the pressure is really low, and at wide open throttle, the pressure goes really high, but it does not go as high as line pressure. It's limited. It's a lower pressure. So the purpose of the throttle valve and throttle pressure is to delay upshifts. There's two purposes, to delay upshifts and to force downshifts. Um, so, a valve in the valve body that causes the transmission to shift from first to second gear is going to have governor pressure on one side trying to push it to the upshifted position. But on the other side of the valve, we have throttle pressure that's going to try to keep it in the downshifted position but the governor always wins and eventually it will upshift. But by increasing or decreasing your throttle angle, you can delay when it shifts. 
So this was one of those patents, that one of the 15 patents on the side of that transmission was to have governor pressure fighting throttle pressure uh, for whether or not you were upshifted or downshifted uh, in the transmission. All right, now uh, the governor, that rotating part that we looked at before, uh, it, it slides into this housing right here and it creates uh, the governor pressure as we've talked about. And it also feeds what's called a reverse blocker valve that I've got uh, labeled right here. Uh, and what that does is it prevents you from engaging the reverse anchor accidentally when the vehicle is moving. Because if the vehicle is moving, then there's governor pressure. Governor pressure forces this blocker valve to come out and it prevents the reverse anchor from engaging until you slow down to a slow enough speed. It does not have to be stopped. It would be like two miles an hour, three miles an hour maybe, um, that would allow you then to shift into reverse, which you should be completely stopped when you shift into reverse uh, anyway. All right, then connected to our valve body, we have one, two, three, four, five, um, pipes, six, seven, eight. There are five fluid pipes that transfer fluid. A couple of them are for boosting the pressure at the pressure regulator. Uh, one of them is to feed governor pressure or to give the governor pressure uh, from the oil pump so it can um, do its job. And then we have just fluid transfer pipes. Um, this whole assembly comes apart. Of course, I've had the whole thing apart. Uh, the governor portion comes off. These, these three pipes come out. Uh, there's an upper and a lower valve body. Uh, there's an extension on both ends. Uh, there was an addition to allow that, that dual range that we talked about for you to downshift into third rather than being stuck in fourth under certain uh, conditions. So that's the brain of the, the computer or brain of the transmission right there, the um, valve body. All right, now to apply the bands, uh, both the front unit band and the rear unit band are applied. And to apply them, we squish the band and make it smaller. There's an anchor pin inside the transmission case that is adjustable from the outside of the case. And let's see, this would be on the top. Uh, there's a special tool I'll show you later to adjust the bands, as it's called. Uh, and then the uh, servo is a hydraulic part that applies the band. It pushes down on it and, and squishes it. Now on this rear band, you can see this gigantic spring right here. That is the spring that forces the band to apply when you shut the engine off that allows you to put the uh, reverse anchor in, in place and essentially have the park position that wasn't invented uh, at that time. But this has a, some hydraulic pistons in that can apply and release the band and control the timing of applying and releasing the band. Because on this transmission, there's a, a difficult transition between uh, applying the band and releasing the clutch that's inside of that same housing or applying the clutch that's inside that same housing and releasing the, the band. Um, so the, the rear band has an anchor pin that's adjustable from the outside of the transmission and it has its own servo to apply it that's controlled by the valve body. The front band is a double wrap band, but it works the same way. It also has an anchor pin in the case, and then it has its own servo right here that applies the band. So this front, front servo has the double wrap band. The rear servo has the single wrap band. Okay. That brings us to 
the clutch packs. So um, let's take a look at the front the front clutch pack. Uh, the front clutch pack has an aluminum piston with a lip seal that uh, sits in the housing uh, in that uh, powertrain stack up that we did, the guts um, of the transmission. Uh, to my surprise, I'd never seen this before. This lip seal, this real early design lip seal, also has a brass expander ring that goes inside of it to force the lip of the seal outward to make it seal better. Um, and the, both front and rear clutch packs, inner and outer seals, have these brass uh, expansion rings. Uh, now the piston sits in the, in the front cover and will push down and apply the clutch pack. The clutch pack on this model has th or four steel plates and four fiber plates. These plates are out of the transmission when I took it apart. They're severely worn. Uh, new clutch plates look like this and you would stack uh, there's some guide pins in here, three guide pins. Uh, you would stack uh, alternating um, fiber and steel. Just like that. So we've got a stack up of clutch plates inside. Steel, fiber, steel, fiber, steel, fiber, steel. Then the clutch piston itself is going to come in and push on that last steel disc and compress it, not compress it, pressurize it. And at that point, it will force the inner hub to turn with the outer hub. Uh, now, all of any of you watching this that have been inside an automatic transmission before will be rolling your eyes, saying, "Boring! I've seen this before." Well, remember this was this is the first transmission to really use this um, in a mass production. Uh, as a matter of fact, that was uh, one of the very first patents on the transmission case was for a, a clutch pack uh, stack up like this. Uh, the front cl front clutch only has um, what did I say? Uh, four four steel and four fiber plates. The return springs, by the way, are just these little tiny uh, return springs that fit down in the slots of the of the housing here between all the plates. The rear clutch has eight fiber plates and eight steel plates uh, in it. But it works just like the, the front one. It's hydraulically applied. Uh, early models used cast iron pistons where the later models used aluminum pistons. Um, a unique thing though that I want to show you on the rear clutch housing is that the rear planet ring gear and the reverse planet sun gear all bolt to this housing and are controlled by the rear clutch or the rear uh, band. So all of this bolts right to this, this housing. And then we've got the, the eight fiber and eight steel plates and the piston uh, down inside of it. Okay, so we take the the rever or the rear planet 
ring gear. It screws in to the rear clutch drum. Just like that. So now if the band stops this housing from rotating, it stops this ring gear from rotating. But then when you assemble the transmission, this is the dividing point for all the parts, by the way, when you reassemble the transmission. From the reverse gear set and the tail shaft housing back, you leave that out and you install all of this up front first. Then you bring the two together and bolt them both them together and you got to be real careful because there's a bushing uh, down in there that if it falls out of alignment uh, so you better use some uh, assembly lube to hold that in place um, then the transmission will bind up and you won't have the proper end play on the input shaft all right so let's let's visually put this together now our rear band, our rear housing that has the rear clutch pack in it, the rear ring gear, the reverse sun gear, all stopped by the band, rotated by the clutch. The front clutch pack is stopped by the front band and rotated by the front clutch. So that's all this thing has in it, are two clutches and two bands. As far as hydraulic applied components. Oh, and that strange uh, cone clutch to uh, help allow reverse to happen. All right. Well, the last thing I want to show you then uh, before we assemble the transmission are the special tools in the overhaul kit uh, that I have. So let me get that over here. Okay, what I have right here on this workbench uh, are the special service tools that I could find for this transmission, which I found about half of them. Uh, and then uh, what's left of the overhaul kit that I haven't shown you already. Uh, first thing I want to show you is the giant Taurus cover gasket and then the flywheel gasket that uh, seals the flywheel to the crank shaft. We've got the side cover gasket, the oil pan gasket. We've got both the front and the rear clutch pack, inner and outer seals. Uh, we have the tail shaft housing gasket, the oil pump gasket, the tail shaft access cover gasket. Uh, we have the cone clutch, inner and outer uh, seals. Um, we have a bunch of cast iron seal rings to replace uh, the other seal rings that are in there. Uh, we have our pressure regulator O-ring, uh, our pickup tube O-ring, our uh, pressure regulator uh, seal. Uh, we've got the seal for the shaft that sticks through the, the side cover. We've got a little roll pin. I can't remember where that goes. And then another a uh, little seal that I can't remember where it goes either. Uh, we have an output shaft seal with the official output shaft driver right here. I've already installed one seal. I found two of them. This is an old Chicago Rawhide uh, seal um, that matches the one that came out of it from the 50s. And then this is the tail shaft housing seal. This was the front pump seal. Uh, this is the tail shaft housing seal and the installer. Um, you could use a hammer, but I use a hydraulic press or an arbor press, I mean, 
uh, to press these in place uh, where possible. I don't like a hammer. Uh, we have a tail shaft seal remover that you connect to a slide hammer and, and pop it out. We have an input shaft end play and centering tool right here. The threads that hold that torus driven member in place thread this tool on right there. That centers the shaft and then you take a dial indicator and measure how much in and out play you have. If you have too much in and out play, then one of your bushings is missing or worn out. If you don't have enough, then one of them's out of place and you need to take the transmission uh, back apart and find out what it is. And then we have, uh, oh, by the way, I found an old snap ring uh, right here in the original unopened Detroit uh, transmission division hydromatic package I thought was interesting uh, on eBay. Um, then we have a, a very useful tool. Um, this is a band adjustment tool right here. And we'll adjust the bands on this transmission case once we put them in. But uh, basically there are two sockets on the bottom of this. One for the band anchor pin uh, center and one for the lock nut. And so you can turn the center piece with this upper handle lock the lock nut with this lower handle. It has a little counter on the top here that counts the number of rotations because for precise band adjustment you tighten it down to a certain point then you back it off so many turns uh, and this will count the turns uh, for you. Uh, I also found on eBay a snap-on version of the same thing from the 50s um, as a little counter uh, on it, but does the same job. And then probably the most amazing thing that I didn't find on eBay, we had it here <laughs> at our auto shop, and I've wondered what it was as long as I've been here for 26 years, is this weird piece right here. This is actually a bench holding fixture for that transmission. So on the end of this workbench over here, we have a receptacle for this shaft right here and it will slide into the bench and then you bolt the transmission to this bracket here and you can work on it, rotate it, uh, makes it nice so you're not wrestling it on the bench while you work on the transmission. So we'll get that bolted up uh, next here. Okay, we're going to take this holding fixture here and it's going to go into this bench holding fixture right here. There's a pin that will lock through the fixture and hold it in place, keep it from falling out. It'll also let you rotate it in 90 degree increments. So I'm going to slide that in. Turn it upside down here. This is an actual Kentmore tool. It's part number J6115-01. It's called a transmission, transmission holding fixture. Oops, so we'll lock that in place right there. I will get the transmission case. All right, I brought the transmission case over from the bench from our first uh, demonstration and we are just going to bring it right in here throw a few bolts in it we'll use the same four bolts that bolt it to the bell housing half that bolts it to the engine and of course I've cleaned up all these threads with a thread chaser. When I got this transmission initially it was covered with years and years of baked on grease and dirt. It was painted Cadillac blue which sort of looks like Ford blue um, and uh, I tried paint uh, stripper and uh, all kinds of stuff and finally we had to sandblast everything to get it as clean 
as it is uh, in, and then once we get it all reassembled we'll paint it uh, blue the official Cadillac blue again doesn't have to be super tight it just holds it in place so now as you can see I can pull this pin out and I can rotate the transmission on its side I can rotate it in any position and uh, work on it which makes it uh, super nice well uh, the next step would be to assemble uh, the transmission so we'll get set up for that next <laughs> 